see you. We, um, we're going to worship the Lord this morning, and I want to remind us as we start our time together. The psalmist says in Psalm 136, that we are to give thanks to the Lord for He is good, for His steadfast love endures forever. We give thanks to the God of gods for His steadfast love endures forever. Give thanks to the Lord of lords for His steadfast love endures forever. The psalmist then goes on throughout that entire chapter for 26 verses to state the history of God's people, the history of Israel, and, and constantly say over and over, for His steadfast love endures forever. We are a people who belong to a God whose steadfast love endures forever. That means His steadfast love is not riding on our ability, our performance, but because He is love. And He has covenanted with us in Christ. He has set His love on us in Christ. And we can rest in that reality today and we can praise Him for that. And so I want to pray to that end. And we're going to worship the Lord together. Let's pray together. Father, thank you that your steadfast love for us in Christ endures forever. May we give thanks to you today. May we praise you. May we worship you together. Would you be exalted among us? Would our hearts be full of gratitude and thanksgiving for who you are and what you've done for us? We love you, Lord. We ask that you meet with us now. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Well, good morning. Let's stand to our feet as you're able and worship him together in spirit and truth this morning.
awakens, awakens, awakens me. Amen. Let's remain standing. We'll recite the Apostles' Creed in just a second. I uh, just want to remind us again that uh, this creed is, is what we believe together as Christians or around the world. Um, it doesn't bring salvation, but it's a tool for teaching that's been handed down to us from the early church. I want to remind us again to think about what you're saying, what you're confessing when you say this. Say it like you mean it. So as we say the Apostles' Creed, we join Christians past and present from all over the world in proclaiming our common faith. I believe in God, Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth. I believe in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord. He was conceived by the power of the Holy Spirit and born of the Virgin Mary. He suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended to the dead. On the third day, he rose again. He ascended into heaven and is seated at the right hand of God the Father Almighty, who will come again to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, forgiveness of sins, resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. You may be seated. This morning we're going to be reading from the Heidelberg Catechism, question 35 and 36. Uh, question, uh, I'll, re I'll say the question, and you please recite the answer with me. Question 35, what does it mean that he was conceived by the Holy Spirit and born of the Virgin Mary? And the answer, that the eternal Son of God, who is and remains true and eternal God, took to himself through the work of the Holy Spirit from the flesh and blood of the Virgin Mary, a true human nature, so that he might also become David's true descendant, like his brothers and sisters in every way except for sin. Uh, the first line of this uh, answer says, the eternal Son of God who is and remains. I believe we used this verse last week, but it's fitting here. John 1, 1, in the beginning was the word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. That, that Word is Jesus there. Um, he wasn't created. He was in the beginning with the Trinity before time and always will be. Uh, the next few lines of the answer. Took to himself through the work of the Holy Spirit from the flesh and blood of the Virgin Mary, a true human nature. In Matthew uh, chapter 1, 18 through 23, we, we read about when Jesus finds out that she will be, or when Mary finds out she will be, uh, can, that she will conceive through the Holy Spirit Jesus. It, it says, Now the birth of Jesus the Messiah took place in this way. When his mother Mary had been engaged to Joseph, but before they <clears throat> lived together, he was found, she was found to be pregnant from the Holy Spirit. Her husband Joseph, being a righteous man and unwilling to expose her to public disgrace, planned to divorce her quietly. But just when he had resolved to do this, an angel of the Lord appeared to him in a dream and said, Joseph, son of David, do not be afraid to take Mary as your wife, for the child conceived in her is from the Holy Spirit. She will bear a son, and you are to name him Jesus, for he will save his people from their sins. And all this took place to fulfill what had been spoken by the Lord through the prophet. Look, the virgin shall come, become pregnant and give birth to a son, and they shall name him Emmanuel, which means God is with us. The last part of the answer. So that he might also become David's true descendant, like his brothers and sisters, in every way except for sin. Now, the Gospels of Matthew and Luke have genealogies that record Jesus' earthly fathers back to David, and then continuing back to Adam, the first man. I'm sure you're thankful that I'm not going to attempt to recite all those this morning. Um, but if we, but we can look at a uh, early hymn of the church, and what many scholars would say is even part of an early creed of the church in Philippians chapter two. Uh, verses 6 through 8, speaking of Jesus, when uh, Paul records, Though he existed in the form of God, he did not regard equality with God as something to be grasped, but emptied himself, taking the form of a slave, assuming human likeness, and being found in appearance as human, 
he humbled himself and became obedient to the point of death, even death on a cross. Now question 36. How does a holy conception and birth of Christ benefit you? And the answer, he is our mediator, and in God's sight, he covers his innocent and perfect holiness, my sinfulness in which I was conceived. We go to Hebrews, the ninth chapter, verses 13 through 15. The, the writer tells us, For if the blood of goats and bulls and the sprinkling of defiled persons with the ashes of a heifer sanctify for the pur purification of the flesh, how much more will the blood of Christ, who through the eternal spirit offered himself without blemish, that is without sin, to God, purify our conscience from dead, from dead works to serve the living God? Therefore, he is a mediator of a new covenant, so that those who are called may receive the promise, the promised eternal inheritance, since a death has occurred that redeems them from the transgressions committed under the first covenant. Our sin has offended an infinite holy God. How can we repay or, or work off this debt? It's impossible, but praise be to God, he has done it for us. He lived the perfect sinless life under the old covenant of works. He fulfilled the whole law, kept it all so we don't have to. He was punished unjustly, for he had done no wrong. Executed on a cross where God placed the sin on him of everyone that he would save for all of his people. And the debt was paid in full there. The work was finished. He rose again to prove his victory. And the new covenant was complete. Let's bow for prayer. Heavenly Father, we thank you, Lord, for our mediator, Jesus, the only one that can, that can pay our debt, that has paid our debt, Lord, to make us righteous in your sight, Father. We know that apart from that, there, there is no hope for us, Lord, that we cannot keep the law, and we thank you that, that we do not have to, Lord. We thank you for, for sending him, Lord, for all the, the prophecies that you've given us, for, for the finished work of Jesus, Lord. We pray that we would remember that and rest in that this morning, Lord, as we continue in worship. I pray that you would be with us all during this time. Let us, in worship and song and in the hearing of your word, glorify your name this morning. Be with us all as we continue to worship you, Lord, and we pray that in everything that we would do your will. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. Well, you're welcome to stand and continue to worship with us. The next couple of songs are very testimonial type songs, so I pray that as we sing these, it would be the testimony of your heart that if the Lord has redeemed you, you would say so by singing so this morning. Alone in my sorrow and dead in my sin Lost without hope with no place to begin Your love made a way to let mercy come in When death was arrested and my life began Ash was redeemed, only beauty remains And my orphan heart was given a name My morning grew quiet My feet rose to death When death was arrested And my life began Oh, your grace So free Washes over
In darkness rejoiced as though heaven had lost But then Jesus arose with our freedom in hand Yes, that's when death was arrested and my life began That's when death was arrested and my life
sinning I shall see thy lovely face clothing in the blood washed linen how I'll sing thy sovereign grace come my Lord no longer tarry take my ransom soul away send thy spirit then to carry me to realms of endless I invite you to stay standing for the reading of the word. We're going to be in 1 John chapter 3, looking at verses 11 through 18 this morning. If you have a copy of God's word, I invite you to turn there. John writes, For this is the message that you have heard from the beginning, that we should love one another. We should not be like Cain, who was of the evil one and murdered his brother. And why did he murder him? Because his own deeds were evil and his brother's righteous. Don't be surprised, brothers, that the world hates you. We know that we have passed out of death into life because we love the brothers. Whoever does not love abides in death. Everyone who hates his brother is a murderer. And you know that no murderer has eternal life abiding in him. By this we know love that He laid down His life for us, and we ought to lay down our lives for the brothers. But if anyone has the world's goods and sees his brother in need, yet closes his heart against him, how does God's love abide in him? Little children, let us, love not, let us not love in word or talk, but in deed and in truth. Let's pray. Father, indeed we are prone to wonder. We are prone to run back to our old ways of not loving. And so, Lord, I pray that by your grace you would sanctify us in the truth. And your word that we are looking to now is truth. Would you open our eyes this morning? Would you teach us? Would you give us understanding? Would you melt our hearts as we gaze at your love for us? I ask that you do this work. In Jesus' name, amen. You can be seated. Uh, Johnny Cash, Andy Griffith last week, Johnny Cash this week. Understand a little bit about Casey Shaw, I guess, in the illustrations that I decide to use. Um, he once put together an album where he tried he sought to identify the themes that marked his music throughout his career. And essentially you could sum up his music and this album in three words: love, God, and murder. Those are the three themes that most define Johnny Cash's music throughout his career and so you could pick that album up I, I get no money from purchasing that album but you could you can purchase it and like a good Johnny Cash song that speaks to the nitty-gritty of life the nature of the heart is first John chapter 3 verses 11 through 18 this passage is about love God and murder that's what it's about John talks about love a lot. He's already talked about love in this epistle. He's going to talk about it again multiple times. He's known in the New Testament as the beloved disciple. John at multiple times and in multiple ways is exhorting believers in this epistle to love one another. 
In a sense, John repeats himself just over and over and over again. He's like a wise teacher that understands, unless I say it 5,000 times, my hearers just won't get it. So that's what he does. But if there is a unique bent that John has in this particular passage, I believe it is to show how we can know that we're children of God. He's just unpacked for us last week in the passage prior that children of God practice righteousness, not sin. It's the moral test that John gives us. And now he's going to tell us that children of God love the children of God. They don't hate. This is the love test in 1 John. And he's going to run through other tests in this epistle as well. The doctrinal test, the spiritual test. And he circles through these tests over and over again, pressing them and applying them to our hearts and minds in different ways, all with the goal of 1 John, in 1 John, writing to believers that we may know we have eternal life. That's his goal. And so his aim in this passage is that we know we're the children of God if we love the children of God. We can know that we're children of God. Last week we saw if we practice righteousness, not sin. This week we know we're the children of God if we love the children of God. That's the simple main idea that he seeks to convey to us this morning. The question really that looms over this entire passage is, is am I a child of God? And John is saying, well, do you practice sin or righteousness? Test number one. Test number two, do you love people, particularly Christians, or do you hate them? That's the test before us. And so I want to show us first the command and then the contrasts here. First, the command in verse 11, for this is the message that you've heard from the beginning that we should love one another. This is nothing new. You've heard this from the beginning. He said it. Jesus has said it. The, the apostles have said it. The entire New Testament, the entire Bible is, is clear here. Now, I could spend all morning showing you verses with this command in it. I'll just go two places to show that this is one of the clearest commands in the Bible. Listen to the clarity of Jesus. John 13, 34, Jesus says, I give you a new command. Love one another just as I have loved you. You must also love one another. That's Jesus. Jesus in John 15, 12, this is my command. Love one another as I have loved you. Jesus in John 15, 17, this is what I command you. Love one another. When asked, what's the most important commandment, Jesus? He says this in Matthew 22, you shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your mind. This is the great and first commandment, and a second is like it. You shall love your neighbor as yourself. And then he says, on these two commandments depend all the law and the prophets. In other words, you obey these two, you obey all the commandments of God. It all hinges there. And John got it. He understood Jesus' particular emphasis on this command. Thus, he's giving the command here. In chapter 4, verse 7, John writes, Beloved, let us love one another, for love is from God, and whoever loves has been born of God and knows God. In chapter 4, verse 11, John is going to say again, Beloved, if God so loved us, we also ought to love one another. And in 2 John, verse 5, he says, writing to the dear lady, he says, Not as though I were writing you a new commandment, but the one we have had from the beginning, that we love one another. The command is clear. Love one another. But what does this mean? What does this look like? Why is this important? So to help us, John is going to give us a little contrast with love's opposite, hate. And so that's the command, but here we see a contrast he gives us. Love and hate in verses 12 through 15. He says, we should not be like Cain. Remember back in Genesis who was of the evil one, murdered his brother Abel. Why did he murder him? Because his own deeds were evil and his brother's righteous. Don't be surprised, brothers and sisters, that the world hates you. We know that we've passed out of death into life because we love the brothers and sisters. 
Whoever does not love abides in death. Everyone who hates his brother is a murderer. And you know that no murderer has eternal life abiding in him. John again, like a wise teacher, not only does he repeat himself over and over again, he uses contrast to un- for us to understand what he means and what he does not mean. He's also doing something else. He's showing us what a Christian is and why love is so crucial. So first, he's showing us what love is by telling us what love is not. He says in verse 12, We should not be like Cain, who was of the evil one, and murdered his brother. And why did he murder him? Because his own deeds were evil and his brother's righteous. John says, Love one another, and love does not look like Cain's treatment of his brother. It's not what love looks like. If you know from Hebrews 11:4 that by faith Abel, who was Cain's brother, offered a more acceptable sacrifice than Cain did. Here's the implication that Cain did not offer his sacrifice by faith. I take that to mean that Abel offered his sacrifice to God, understanding that God deserves his all. And Cain offered his sacrifice because he felt he deserved something from God. Thus, when Abel's sacrifice was accepted, Cain was jealous, filled with hate, and the first murder in the history of the world was committed. One brother killing his flesh and blood brother. Why did Cain kill his brother? There's really kind of two underlying roots there. First, he killed his brother because he was of the evil one. Verse 12 says, We should not be like Cain, who was of the evil one. Cain killed his brother because he was a child of the devil. If you remember verse 10 from last week, By this it is evident who are the children of God and who are the children of the devil. Whoever does not practice righteousness is not of God, nor is the one who does not love his brother. There are two camps, two kingdoms, two families in this earth. There's no neutral kingdom or family. Cain belonged to the devil. Thus, Cain killed his brother, not only because he was of the evil one, but it also says because his own deeds were evil and his brother's righteous. So Cain killed Abel because those who are of the devil hate the righteous. They hate God's people. Do you see what John is saying? You either belong to God, practice righteousness and love others, or... You belong to the devil, practice sin, and hate others, especially God's people. Those are the two camps. Those are the two families. Those are the two kingdoms that exist in this world, kind of like the Hatfields and the McCoys, except they hate each other, and God's people are called to something higher and better. Those who belong to the devil practice sin and hate others, especially God's people. That's why John throws this little note of encouragement to God's people in verse 13. He says, don't be surprised, brothers and sisters, when the world hates you. Don't be surprised, brothers, that the world hates you. Cain, who represents the world, hated Abel and killed him. The world hated Jesus and killed him. So those of us in Christ, he says, don't be shocked when the world hates you. Maybe even takes your life. That's just par for the course. Don't be discouraged by the hatred of the world. The world hates the people of God because we have what the world does not have. So John then... He not only contrasts love and hate, he also then shows us what a Christian is and the significance of love in this. He he changes gears to the Christian, don't be surprised if the world hates you. 
And he tells us what a Christian is. I don't want to pass over this. He's, he tells us that a Christian is someone who has passed out of death into life. I love that we sang that death was arrested. That's what he says there. In verse 14, we know that we've passed out of death into life. A Christian was once a dead person who, who now lives. Don't overlook or over just read over how utterly amazing that is. Martin Lloyd-Jones says a, a lot of our troubles in the Christian life is we go to what Christians ought to do versus thinking about what Christians are, who we are. John is writing to believers and he says, we know we've passed out of death into life. So just as jaw-droppingly amazing as it was for Lazarus' friends to see him walk out of the grave is to see a Christian. It's the same. It's just as amazing to see someone born of God as it was for them to see Lazarus walk out of the grave. To lay your eyes on a Christian is to lay your eyes on a walking miracle. Really. Once dead in sin, now alive to God in Christ. This is unbelievable. This is utterly amazing. And, and you could say, how could we claim such a thing? How audacious Christians can claim such a thing. How can we know we've passed from death to life? Because we have a Savior who has passed from death to life. Because we believe and we have come to the responsible conclusion that the historical Jesus of Nazareth really lived. He never sinned. He really died on a Roman cross. He was really put in Joseph's tomb. And then when his people went to anoint his dead body on Sunday, he wasn't there. Not because they stole him, because they were assuming he was dead. And not because Rome stole him, because they would have produced his dead body. But because he was alive and then revealed himself not only to them, but to hundreds others. And since that time, the gospel of Jesus Christ has spread like wildfire throughout the earth. Because he's alive. We have a Savior who passed from death to life. And He died for our sins. The, the perfect sacrifice for our sins. And by faith, God looks at us, does not count our sins against us, and imputes His righteous life to us. And we're alive by faith in Christ. Really alive. So don't miss that. But John's ultimate aim here is not to tell us who we are. He is telling us that, but he's going to tell us how we know that we're alive. What is proof? What is the fruit of the living root of Christ in us? Right now, we just put in a bunch of plants in our garden yesterday. And I could walk through and tell you what they are, but it's like, it just looks like some leaves to me. You really won't know until you see fruit coming out. So what's the fruit of Christ in us? He says, we know that we've passed out of death into life because we love the brothers. Whoever does not love abides in death. Everyone who hates his brother is a murderer, and you know that no murderer has eternal life abiding in him. There's three observations I want to point out in this particular passage here. We know we are children of God if we love the children of God. To not love is to not live, and hatred is murder. First, we know that we're the children of God if we love the children of God. He says, we know. We know we've passed out of death into life because we love the brothers. And by brothers here, he means Christians. Brothers and sisters also united to Christ by faith. We love God's people. Now, I want to be clear here because we flip-flop these things. John does not say we pass from death to life when we love the brothers. 
No, he says, we know we have passed from death to life because we actively, we do, present active, love the brothers. It's evidence that we are saved. One of the primary ways we know that we have been born of God is that we love the people of God. Let me say it this way. You cannot, love, you cannot claim to love Jesus and hate his church. It's a pretty popular saying among people. I love Jesus, but I don't care for his church. I don't care for his people. You need to be careful saying that. Jesus has some really intimate language when he refers to his church. He calls his church his bride. I don't know about you, but anyone who comes up to me and says, I like you, man, but I can't stand your wife. You're no friend of mine then. No loving husband in the world would say, yeah, I'm cool with that logic. And Jesus isn't okay with it either. The Bible tells us that when God causes us to be born again he gives us a new heart he removes our heart of stone and he gives us a heart of flesh and woven in that heart of flesh is love for people particularly the people of God that he has put in that new heart that he gives us in that spiritual heart surgery surgery, he gives us the heart he gives us has in it love for others. And if your heart has no love for others, then you didn't get it from God in the spiritual sense of being born again. You have no reason to believe yourself to be a Christian if you hate people. That's what John is saying. Second thing I want to say observation about this particular verse whoever to to not love is to not live notice he says whoever does not love abides in death and you might be thinking love is so costly I just don't know about this to which I'd say yeah love is absolutely costly It'll rip your heart out. You will get hurt. It will cost you something. Maybe everything, as we'll see more in in a little bit. But to not love is far more costly. Whoever does not love abides in death. To choose a life void of love is to choose death. It is to abide in death, to remain and live in it. It's essentially choosing the life of Ebenezer Scrooge who would rather serve his self than others in need. Now, I am not making this point to persuade non-believers to choose a life of love. You can't. I'm making this point to persuade believers who, who when tempted to withhold love to remember that our, our loveless life prior to Christ was death. That was death, guys. That it is truly more blessed to give than to receive. Do you believe that? Are you dwelling in death or are you walking in love? The third observation from this verse is hatred is murder. These these are strong words. John says everyone who hates his brother is a murderer. He doesn't even say, is like a murderer. He says, is a murderer. And you know that no murderer has eternal life abiding in him. Friends, we ought not play any games. And I'm saying this as someone who has struggled with bitterness and resentment. We ought not play games with bitterness and resentment residing in our hearts. While many would not dare carry out the physical act of murder, many flippantly entertain the emotional act of murder all the time. And it's called hate. The goal, the end goal of hate is murder. 
Jesus has strong words. This is where John got this, this, this thinking. Jesus himself says, You've heard that it was said to those of old, You shall not murder, and whoever murders will be liable to judgment. Jesus says, But I say to you that everyone who's angry with his brother will be liable to judgment. Whoever insults his brother will be liable to judgment or to the council. And whoever says you fool will be liable to the hell of fire. Jesus' words ought to sober us when it comes to any unloving thought, feeling, or word that lies in our hearts or comes from our lips. God views the man on death row for physically slaying his victim the same as the one who roams free while slandering his balls. God views the man on death row for physically slaying his victim the same as the one who despises the one he's sitting beside in his small group at church. God views the man on death row for physically slaying his victim the same as the man who sits on his own couch emotionally slaying his wife. Hatred is murder. And John says, you know that no murderer has eternal life abiding in him. You don't have it. You don't know God. Children of God, by the Spirit of God, because that's the only way we could ever do it, love the children of God. We don't hate one another. The world does that. And they do a really good job at it. But God's people don't. That's why Jesus said, they will know that you're my disciples by your love for one another. They will know, the world will know. We prove to the watching world that we belong to God by how we treat one another. We prove to the watching world that we have passed from death to life by our love for one another. We prove to the watching world that we have eternal life abiding in us by our love for one another. Church, do we prove this? Do you prove this in your life? Do I prove this with my life? Do people look into the window of the church, so to speak, and say, there's just, they have something that we don't have. And I hate it, but I respect it. The Roman emperor Julian, he was writing in the 4th century, says, regretted the progress of Christianity because it was pulling people away from the Roman gods. He said, quote, atheism, which is what they called the Christian faith back then, has been specially advanced through the loving service rendered to strangers. And through their care for the burial of the dead. It's a scandal that there is not a single Jew who is a beggar. And that the godless Galileans care not only for their own poor but for ours as well. While those who belong to us look in vain for the help that we should render them. He was saying the Christians do a better job caring for our sick and our dying than we do. And then he instituted a program where he called his pagan priests, just do what the Christians do. And guess what happened? The program failed because they could not do it. Why? They did not have eternal life dwelling in them. They did not have the Spirit of God. They still had hearts of stone. The world can love people, but it always circles back really to love for self. Christians are the only people who can truly say, I love you. You, I I love you, period. So what? How do I practice love for my brothers and sisters in Christ? I've got three points of application here in the next few verses. How do I practice love for my brothers and sisters in Christ? The first one is this, look to the cross. 
That's why John says, by this we know. Love, that he laid down his life for us. And so we ought to lay down our life for the brothers. We know what love is because God has shown us love at Calvary. John won't leave us with any sorts of vague notions about what love is like, which is what this world gives us. It's what the Beatles give us, right? All you need is love. Love, 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 love. Love is all you need. Over and over and over. Just this vague, that's all we need. Love. And it's up to you and your internal self to define what that looks like and is. No, in a real sense, love is all you and I need, but it's not vague. It's not up for us to determine. It is God who is love, sending His most prized, precious Son from the glories of heaven to redeem His vile, dead enemies from earth. If we wish to know love, how to love, to what extent to love, we must look to the cross. We must never take our eyes off of the cross. Love is brutal but beautiful. And in a very real sense, it was a verb hanging on a Roman cross for sinners like you and I. God says, this is love. He laid down his life for us. So brothers and sisters, when you and I consider withholding love from an unlovable person, Remember that God did not withhold His love from an unlovable you. He didn't. First step in practically loving our brothers and sisters in Christ is don't ever take your eyes off the cross of Christ. Second, we must sacrifice ourselves for the eternal and practical good of others sacrifice ourselves for the eternal and practical good of others. John says, but if anyone has the world's goods, sees his brother in need, yet closes his heart against him, how does God's love abide in him? He's working here from a greater to lesser argument. He says, by this we know love, that he laid down his life for us, and so we ought to lay our life down for the brothers. How glorious is that? If Christ died for us, we ought to die for one another. That's the greatest act of love, right? To lay one's life down for another. Jesus paid the ultimate sacrifice for you, so church, are we willing to go to that extent for one another? Are we willing to say, I love you, I die for you? Yes. But John says, let's get practical, okay? Okay you and I probably aren't going to be faced with that. We probably aren't. If that day comes, by God's grace, may we demonstrate that level of love. But John says, let's, let's just be practical about this. You probably won't be faced with that decision. But, if anyone has the world's goods and sees his brother or sister in need, and what's your heart going to do? Is your heart that said, I'll die for you, will it close when you have to give away your stuff? Jesus gave his life. Can we give our stuff? We routinely throw all of our kids' toys in the living room. Just do it. do it. Do it with your kids. Just throw it all. We should do this as adults. Just, we just throw them all in the living room. And, and the whole living room just is covered. And we give them their basket that they have. When the basket's full, everything else is, is gone. We're not, we're not doing more than that. This is what you need. And you see the, the weeping and gnashing of teeth as we cast off our idols. But you also see your kids that thinking, that I thought this would make me happy and I'm willing to throw the trash can. We ought to do that as adults. It won't make you happy. What will make you happy is saying, oh, Jesus gave his life for me. I'll give my stuff for you. We 
must not be like the unforgiving servant who was forgiven a debt he could never repay then refused to help the one who owed him a payable debt. Look to the cross and then we freely sacrifice ourselves, our stuff, our time, our money, our resources for the eternal and practical good of each other. It's all the Lord's anyway. And the third thing is this. We must ask God to open and purify our heart. He says, little children, let us not love in word or talk, but in deed and in truth. Don't just say you love it. But actually love. And not close our hearts. The only way these things are possible if we plead to the Lord to help us do these things. Oh God, by your spirit, may we put to death the deeds of the flesh, but also practice love as you have shown us love. This requires much dependence on the Lord because you and I are not bent toward this level of living. We're not. And I'll just end on this kind of a transparent pastoral note on loving the church. Because my guess is that many of us are in the same boat. My deepest wounds have come from the church, not from the world. Sometimes we are wounded by actual believers that make us think, I. That's why people say things like, I love Jesus, but not his church. That's why people say that. I have sympathy for the person who would say that. Been prone to think that. Being wounded by Christians is, is confusing because we think, you ought not act like that. And to some level, we're right. Christians ought not act like that. They ought not to. But what is also right is Christians sometimes do act like that. There's a reason God refers to His people as sheep. And He doesn't refer to His people as a well-oiled machine. And you know what's true about sheep? Sheep. We were at a farm yesterday for a birthday party. They are stupid. Sometimes they bite. And sometimes they stink. You know what's also true? This is true for every person who is in Christ. You're a sheep. Which means that sometimes... You're stupid. Now don't just, don't take that out of context and say, Casey said, I was stupid. I will never go back to that church again. That is not what I said. I said you were stupid, but I didn't say you were stupid. Sheep are sometimes stupid, which means sometimes I am. I'm susceptible to being stupid. Hard to be around. Mean. You just ask my wife. She'll tell you, yeah, he's a sheep. That's a description. Ask your spouse. Ask your friends. My point is, the wounds of Christians are deeply hurtful, sometimes very hurtful. But that's when we look to the cross, brothers and sisters. Christ did not die for the well he died for sinners like us people who are as we just sang prone to wonder sometimes hard to be around sometimes we bite and love presses through that and says if Christ so loved me I'm willing to so love you even if you bite me and by our love church we know that we are children of God when we love the children of God and we prove to the watching world they're the children of God. So may we love one another. Let's pray. Father, I ask that you would open and purify our hearts to love as you have loved. In this is love 
Not that we have loved you, but that you have loved us and you gave your only son. So that we might live through you. God, impress upon our hearts the deep and profound love of Jesus. Lord, if there's anyone in here that has a heart of stone, that every fiber of their being is like, no way I'm not loving another person. I don't want to enter a life of love. May you melt every heart of stone by your love. Would you fix all of our eyes on the cross and melt our hearts of stone and sin? We need your help. In your name, amen. Friends, we respond to the teaching of the word by coming to the Lord's table to partake of the cup, the bread, as a reminder that Jesus, in this is love, that his body was crushed for us and his blood was shed for the forgiveness of our sins. We come to the table not as perfect but as repentant, resting in the love of God for us in Christ alone. It is the love of God that has redeemed us from our sin. I kindly ask that you not come to the table if the love of God means nothing to you. If the love of God revealed through the death of Christ means nothing to you, please don't come to the table. But for those of us who are clinging to Christ alone, by faith alone, may we remember Him. May we contemplate the love of Christ, which is beyond comprehension. Let's respond. What love could remember no wrongs we have done? Omniscient, all-knowing, he counts not their sum. Thrown into a sea without bottom or shore. Our sins, they are many, but his mercy is more. Let's stand and sing those words together.
But love could remember no wrongs we have done. Omniscient, all knowing, he counts not their sum. Thrown into a sea without bottom or shore. Our sins, they are many, his mercy. Praise the Lord, His mercy is more. Stronger than darkness, new every morn. Our sins, they are many, His mercy is more. would wait as we constantly roam. What father so tender is calling us home. He welcomes the weakest, the vilest, the poor. Our sins, they are of kindness he's lavished on us his blood was the payment his life was the cause we stood neath the debt we could never afford our sins they are many but his mercy I know in really studying through 1 John, but especially a passage like this, you see this measuring stick and you think, I don't know. Maybe I'm not a Christian. I've got a, I've got a, lot, of, a lot of work to do in the love department. Robert McShane says, For every look at yourself, take ten at Christ. So, the response is to examine yourself, yes. But don't take your eyes off of the cross. Don't take your eyes off of the cross. Don't walk out of here thinking, well, um, all right, if I just love, maybe maybe do 10 more acts of love this week, then, then maybe I'll prove to my... Like, don't think like that. Forget yourself. Look to Christ and love others. 
Love is forgetting yourself and serving others. So walk out of here looking at Christ who has loved you in ways that you do not deserve and take his love to others. Take his love to the people he's put in your life, to our church family, to your neighbors and to the nations. All right? I'll leave with one. I announced it last week, but for any people who were not here, any ladies were having a baby shower for Abigail on Friday, May 10th at 6 o'clock at Joanne's house. Um, Joanne, I think, has maybe formal uh, invitations to that. But I just want you to know, put that on your cal- calendar, ladies, and, and bless Abigail, bless her family. Um, let me close this in prayer. Father, thank you for loving us. Thank you that there is more mercy in Christ than sin in us. You are full of mercy, new every morning. So may we walk out of this room under the banner of victory in Christ, under the banner of your love, fueled by your love to love others as you have loved us. Help us, Lord, in Jesus' name. Amen. Have a great week.